Hello, we're going to take a look at how Radiant Technology can open in one-tenth of a second a data set that the U.S. federal government says takes uh, Esri Arc products almost 30 minutes. Uh, that sounds astonishing, but let's, uh, take a, let's take a close look. We're looking at Manifold Viewer, a desktop for Manifold Viewer, which is the free version of Radiant Studio. We're going to use Manifold Viewer so that uh, you can try this at home by downloading a free product. I'm going to click File, Open. And this is the data set that we're going to open. It's a bathymetry data set for the Gulf of Mexico. That's seven and a half gigabytes. It's in radian.map format. Let's click open and see how long it takes. Remember, this takes 30 minutes according to the US government in uh, Esri products. One, two, three, click. There, it's done. In fact, it opened that data set in a tenth of a second, uh, quicker than, I could, than my finger could come off the top of the mouse. Let's now see how quickly I can visualize all this data. Again, it's about seven and a half gigabytes of data. <clears throat> I'm gonna double click on this map component here to open it. One, two, three, double click. There, it's done. Uh, again, as you can see, that's uh, instant. Uh, Radian map format is extremely fast, uh, it's, uh, and we're looking at this with a fully parallel system, both of which are advantages. Now, the backstory to this, why we're trying this, is that uh, a little while ago on uh, Reddit, in the GIS subreddit, there was a talk about this a wonderful new data set that the uh, federal government published, which shows a uh, bathymetry, that is uh, underwater uh, depths, uh, for the underwater terrain off the Gulf of Mexico. And what we're looking at here is the geology of salt domes and such. And people were uh, rightfully excited about the data. It was unprecedented detail, the, the finest, most detailed data set ever, like this ever published by the U.S. government. But when you go to the uh, federal government website to download the data, the government there warns you that if you want to download it in ARC format for uh, uh, ESRI products, uh, it could take up to 30 minutes to open the data. Now that struck us as astonishing because ESRI products are very good products. Uh, you know, rightfully respected around the world. So uh, we couldn't believe it would take that long, even though this is a rather large data set. So we decided to try it and see how long it would take in Radian. And the answer is that uh, once you import it into Radian, which takes a couple minutes, and then write out the, uh, the data set in, in a Radian map format, which takes no time at all, uh, then, you can, then you can take that map and open it in Radian or open it somewhere else. That's the ana an analogous format to Esri's own native format and it takes only a tenth of a second to open it. <clears throat> so the difference is quite dramatic. Let's take a look at what we're, uh, what we're seeing here and what we're working with. What we're working with is a map here, and a map is, uh, we can click that off or click that back on. A map is a uh, radian uh, component which is, uh, has layers in it. And here there's two layers. There's a, uh, a layer here above the other layer. This is the, this is the western half of the data set and that's the eastern half of the data set. We can double click a layer on and off. And uh, what are these data sets? We can open them up, not just in the map, but we can also open them on their own. So we can double click on the, on the western image, western raster data set. And uh, <clears throat> if we right click on the properties, we can see that what we have here is a component that takes this data, it's tiles from this table full of tiles. So the actual raster display it doesn't contain any data in this thing here. That's just a window, as it were, into the uh, a visualization of this table that's full of tiles. If we double click the table open, we can, uh, let's control end, jump to the end of the table, and see that it's made up of uh, lots and lots of tiles. To f get information about that table, we can click on the info pane, and we see that this table uh, is full of tiles, and it has uh, 97,825 records. So there's 97,825 tiles, and each of those tiles is 128 by 64 pixels, and each pixel is, uh, has a flow 32 number in it. Now what we're looking at here is actually not a dead image. This is something that uh, Radian is, uh, uh, is a train elevation data set that Radian is uh, on the fly converting into synthetic image. It's hill shading it and it's coloring it according to the palette. Uh, but uh, all that uh, takes uh, very little time, so the actual and very little uh, amount of data. So the actual data that's in here in this image is, is, is almost negligible. It's just these basically these properties which uh, specify you know, how, how the pixel should be styled and where it should get its tiles. All the data is in here uh, in that table. We can exploit that by making copies of this uh, raster image, raster display. I choose copy and then paste and then I'll rename this. I'm going to rename this uh, John. We're going to do a Beatles theme here. And if we click open John, we see that is uh, the same thing. 
It's just a copy of that data. In fact, we can take John and we can drag and drop John into the uh, map here as another layer. So here's the John layer. And if we like, we can style that John layer because style, that is uh, how it's, the display is formatted, is a property of the, uh, of the raster image display. It's not a property of the actual tiles. So here's the uh, palette that we're using. We can uh, change the palette. Let's just uh, reverse the color. So I'll highlight all the color wells and choose reverse. So now the colors are reversed. So that red is the lowest and blue is the highest. Click apply. And as you can see, this is now changed. This is the original tile and this is the John tile. Double click that back on. Let's click edit style. Go back into the John. Let's, let's, actually, let's, let's actually create one more copy of this. So we're going to take this copy in here, paste, and we'll call this one, uh, let's call this Paul. So now we have a Paul layer and drag and drop Paul layer. That's still the original coloration and that Paul layer completely conceals the layer layers beneath it because it's, uh, it's opaque. So the Paul layer, let's uh, change that. Let's uh, edit style and let's give it a completely different palette. Let's use a uh, one of the color burr palettes. Actually, I'm going to move this dialog over here so you can see what I'm working with it before it gets out of range of what's being recorded. Color Brewer, and let's use the Accent Palette. It chose the palette, now let's apply the palette. Great, to the color wells, and now when you click Apply here, we can see that's an entirely different coloration. Now how it's coloring the palette, as you can see, there's a transition here between from the blue to the red in this zone because we were using Interpolate, so pixels that are some value in height between 15, minus 1529 and minus 1159 are colored uh, an interpolated shade between the blue and the red. If we wanted to, we can make that a hard edge by choosing closest lower value. And then we're quantizing it so that everything that's uh, between this number and that number, all the depths between this number and that number are all colored blue. And then the ones that are between this one and that one are all colored this uh, magenta color. That's great, and uh, if we like, we can choose the highest value, close to highest value. That's a different way, way of quantizing it. Makes for a pretty cool display. And of course, because all this is a property of the particular layer, of the Paul layer, which you can double click open in its own window, uh, that hasn't changed the uh, palette we applied to the John layer or the palette that we applied to the original uh, layer because all these are just different ways of coloring the same data which is coming from these tiles. The tiles, the data of the tiles itself is just train elevations. All this is being synthesized on the fly. Uh, now that's important to know because when it's, all this is being synthesized on the fly, that's a lot of work for uh, seven gigabytes of data. It's not just taking a dead image and displaying it, which rating of course could also do. Uh, let's do one other thing here. Let's take a look at what we're using here for uh, a projection. If we look at this, uh, any of these, we can see that edit change projection, we can see they're on transverse Mercator. And if we look at the actual, the map, let's close this and here's the map image that we have. Zoom to fit. The map in image, if we look at the info, the coordinate system is also transverse Mercator. Uh, in uh, Radian and in Manifold Viewer, a map can have a different projection than the components that it shows. In this case, the components, the layers that are in the map, all are in transverse Mercator, and the map itself is in transverse Mercator. So it's not doing any re reprojection. But the map could be in a different projection. The map could use, say, something like latitude and longitude. Let's unclick this layer, unclick that layer. So now we're looking at the two layers originally. Let's create another map, new map. And uh, when we click it open, it's uh, empty at first. Let's drag and drop the uh, western layer into it. Now let's drag and drop the eastern layer into it. And zoom to fit. And now let's change the projection of the map. The map projection, let's make it something else like latitude longitude instead of transverse Mercator. Uh, as you can see from the coordinate system dialog here, Radian knows thousands of projections. It knows over 5,000 EPSG codes, for example. And you can do custom projections, and it knows hundreds if not thousands of standard ones. There's so many that the only way to find a projection that you're interested in is to use this filter box, where if I put in the letter L, it shows all the projections that have the letter L in them. If I put the letters LA, it shows all the projections that have the pattern LA, for example, anything with Finland or Canada, or excuse me, uh, Ireland. 
LAT shows projections that have the three letters LAT in sequence, and LATI reduces that down just the latitude and longitude projection. I'm going to click on that to select it, so we can see here the parameters it's going to use, WGS84 and all that. Click OK. And now that map is uh, in latitude and longitude projection. The original data that it's showing, all that is still in uh, I'll open this. All that is still in transverse Mercator. So what's going on here is that uh, viewer is uh, using radiant technology to reproject on the fly seven gigabytes of data to show us this uh, the data set that's in transverse Mercator is being reprojected on the fly to be displayed in uh, latitude longitude. And if we click on the other map, which is in Stone Transfer Mercator, we click back and forth between the two, we can see that the uh, latitude and longitude projection is visually somewhat different than the uh, Transverse Mercator. At this particular latitude, uh, that is the northern part of the Gulf of Mexico, there isn't that great a visual difference between latitude and longitude projection and Transverse Mercator. So they look fairly sim similar. But the astonishing thing is that rating is not only generating all this stuff on the fly, that is all the hill shading and all the synthetic imagery, the synthetic, the synthetic terrain, and uh, all the coloration of it and all that. It's actually also reprojecting it on the fly, which is all very cool. And that's quite amazing for, uh, you know, what is a free product. There are uh, plenty of uh, software products that would take uh, hours to reproject uh, uh, a seven gigabyte data set from one projection such as a transverse Mercator into another projection, latitude and longitude, let alone be able to do it on the fly. Uh, to see what kind of machine we're using here, by the way, we'll click Help About, and we can see that what we're working with is an Intel Core i7, a 920, which is a very old Core i7, it's probably six or eight years old, something like that, 2.67 gigahertz. It has four cores, which Windows 10 treats as eight hyper cores. So one reason this is so fast is because Radiant Studio and Manifold Viewer are both uh, uh, using it as uh, all, eight, all eight of those cores. One reason software like uh, ARC or QGIS or all the other jazz packages is so slow with large data like this is because they're only using one core, they're not parallel. So they're only using about 15% of the power of the computer, whereas Manifold Viewer here is using 100% of the power of the computer. Now one important difference between Manifold Viewer and Radiant Studio is that Manifold Stu that Radiant Studio is fully GPU parallel as well as CPU parallel. So if you have a GPU card in here that has hundreds or thousands of cores, Radiant will use that for uh, absolutely super computer performance. Viewer is not CPU parallel. Is, excuse me, it's not GPU parallel, it's just CPU parallel. So the incredible speed and performance that we're seeing here from Viewer is coming just purely from CPU parallelization. The amazing thing is that if we were running Radiant and if we had a GPU, that would be even faster. Let's do one last thing here, and uh, let's add a data set source. We're going to add two. We're going to add one that's called Bing, B-I-N-G. Let's not offend Microsoft by misspelling their product name. And we'll get the Bing Street Maps image server. Radian and Viewer make it easy to uh, work with uh, uh, web servers, to pull in tiles from uh, web servers automatically so we can see where this is in context. And here we're using uh, the Bing web server. The Bing Street Maps image server, by the way, is, uh, if we look at the info for it, is providing tiles that are in WGS84 pseudo Mercator. That's pretty much the standard uh, projection that almost all web servers use these days. Uh, and uh, the cool thing is that when we're looking at this map, which is in transverse Mercator, not pseudo Mercator, uh, Manifold Viewer is actually reprojecting the data that's getting from. Uh, uh, being on the fly. That's why the le letters look a little bit off here because uh, the letters are also being reprojected into a slightly different projection. Let's uh, add one more data source. We're going to add the uh, Google uh, satellite image. And you can see, by the way, here, Radian knows this is just the image servers that it knows. It also knows hundreds of uh, uh, OSM, TAL servers, WFS, WMS, WMS, MTS, and on and ArcGIS REST, on and on and on. Just hundreds of options. But we're going to use Google Maps Satellite right now. I'm going to create the data source. And now I'll we'll drag and drop that into the map. And that gives us a satellite image from Google. What Google does is uh, they give you a satellite image over land. 
uh, but then uh, over ocean areas, instead of a satellite image, they just kind of automatically blend in uh, the Google version of terrain elevation data for the ocean bathymetry. And if we double click off the right hand layer here of our uh, Gulf data set, we can see how perfectly the Gulf data set that we imported aligns with what Google does. And uh, when, when Radian, or for that matter any Manifold product like uh, Manifold Viewer, work with uh, georeference data, uh, it automatically maintains the georeferencing of that data. That is, it automatically maintains it perfectly in context, no matter how often you copy and paste it from one thing to another. So, for example, the uh, Paul data set here is, is also perfectly uh, georegistered to what Google is doing. We can also hear what the advantage. We can also see here what the advantages of using something like Viewer. Uh, Google just shows you what they want to show you. So they're showing you some hill shaded terrain here. But you're not getting the full resolution data set all the time. And uh, you don't have the ability to color it in different ways as, uh, as you'd like to extract more information to uh, do as they say, knowledge discovery. Now I should emphasize that all this uh, super fast stuff that we're doing here, it depends on uh, using radio fo radian format. Uh, you can take this data set, the Gulf data set, and import it directly into Viewer. Uh, that's going to take you a couple of minutes to import it. And then you can also color it and all this other stuff. It's more convenient if we just clicked open the map uh, the radi in radian map format like we did to start this uh, video. Uh, somebody else created that map. What they did is they imported the Gulf data set into radian, and then they saved and then they colored it, and then they saved it using the palette, and they saved it as a radian map. But that's also useful to know because people who are more expert and who have Radian Studio, which after all is not an expensive product, it's only about $250, uh, under $300, um, can publish data sets like this for anybody to use with Viewer. And Viewer really is free. It's not a nagware. It's not a, some sort of limited time trial. It's not a crippleware or anything like that. It has just phenomenal capabilities, which the other viewers, which the other uh, videos get into. It's also bulletproof. I should note that uh, if you're used to modern software, you know that kind of in modern times we have a problem with software being just absolutely horrible quality. You know, people write uh, threads for each other about how their Esri software is crashing all the time. People complain QGIS crashes all the time. The software that we're using to record this, uh, Camtasia, for example, uh, is just so totally bug ridden, it's, it's, it's almost impossible to use sometimes. And in particular, this recording was done three times to get one that actually worked because the, the recording software kept crashing. Uh, Viewer never crashes, and Radian never crashes. Now, I'm sure sooner or later it will crash because it is software after all. It was created by humans, so there's got to be some bugs in it. We know that. Uh, but in three years of beta testing, despite all the massively parallel, super-duper complexity and full SQL and programming, uh, Radian Studio never crashed not once. And Viewer is Radian. It's just the read-only version of Radian. So as uh, Radian improves, and as updates get issued for Radian, you get this for free with Viewer as well. So thanks for watching, and I hope you've enjoyed the tour. Uh, and uh, goodbye from Radian Land. Well, that was fun. Uh, if you want to see more, visit us at www.manifold.net. Uh, as always, Manifold delivers the world's most advanced, highest quality spatial products for GIS and DBMS at a low price that you can afford. Once again, that's uh, manifold.net. See you soon.